Hi, my name is Jessica Lanius, and in today's talk, we're going to discuss the definition of a group, explore some examples to build your intuition, and then investigate subgroups and subgroup lattices. So first, let's get started with the definition of a group. A group is a set denoted by the letter G and a binary operation denoted by star, for which the following properties hold for every A, B, and C elements of G. The first is that the group is closed under the operation star, meaning that for any two elements in G, when we operate those together, we get an element that's also in G. The second is that the associativity property holds under the operation star. The third property is that there exists an identity element, such that whenever you operate any element in the set G with this identity element, we get the same element back out. And the fourth property is that there are inverses for every element. And I really want to stress the inverses, plural here, because our property before this states that we have an identity element, singular, that works for all of our elements. Whereas for this property, we have an inverse for every single element. And so for all of our elements in the set, there exists an unique inverse to that element, such that when you operate the element and its inverse together, we get back out the identity element. And now for these last two properties, it doesn't matter which order we operate the two elements in. So for the identity element, we can do A star E or E star A. And the same thing for the inverses. We can take the element star its inverse or the inverse star the element and still get E. We denote our groups as written below with the bracket, G for the group, the operation star, and then the identity element. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example. I want us to focus on whether or not the integers under addition is a group. So our first question we have to ask ourselves is if it's closed. So the question there is, does adding two integers always give us an integer? That's yes, so we now know that our group is closed. The second question is if the group is associative under the operation star. Our operation here is addition. So we have to ask ourselves, are the integers associative under addition? I've written one specific example there because sometimes it's easier to think about it with an example, but we do know that the integers under addition is associative. Our next question is, does there exist an identity element? So let's go ahead and look at this with another specific example. I took the integer 5, which we know is in our integer group, and I asked, can we add an integer to 5 in order to get 5? And the answer to that's yes, because we'll be using 0, and 0 is an integer. Now we have to go ahead and generalize that. Can we add an integer to n in order to get n? And the answer there is yes, we're working with 0. And since we know that that works for any integer n, we know that there is an identity element in our group. Now the last question is whether or not we have inverses. And you'll actually notice that this is the really tricky question as we move forward and look at more complex groups. Again, I gave us a specific example. So we ask ourselves, can we add an integer to 5 to get 0? In this case, we're looking for negative 5, and negative 5 is an integer. So the answer there is yes. But let's go ahead and generalize this one as well. Can we add an integer to n to get 0? The answer here again is yes. What we're doing is we're adding the integer negative n. Because we know that all of these properties hold, we can conclude that yes, the integers under addition is a group. And since we know that, we can go ahead and write it using our group notation with the integers, addition, and zero. So let's go ahead and take a look at another example. Let's take a look at the integers under multiplication. So now we're going to ask the same questions. Is the set closed? Does multiplying two integers get us back an integer? And the answer is yes. So we know that the set is closed. Our next question is, is the integers under multiplication associative? And again, I've listed another concrete example that you can go ahead and try at home. But we know that multiplication is associative when we're working with the integers. So the answer there is yes as well. Our next question is, do we have an identity? So again, I took the example of the number 5. Can we multiply an integer to 5 to get 5? And here the answer is yes as well. But 
Our identity is different than it was for the previous group. Our identity here is 1. So again, let's generalize. Can we multiply an integer to n in order to get n? And the answer there is, again, yes. We're working with the integer 1. So we do have an identity for all of our elements. Now let's go ahead and talk about the idea of inverses. Can we multiply an integer to 5 in order to get 1? Go ahead and think about that for a moment. The number that we're looking to multiply by here is 1 fifth. However, 1 fifth is not an integer, meaning that it's not in our group. Therefore, we do not have inverses for all of our elements. And because we've broken that one example, we know that no, the integers under multiplication is not a group. Now we're going to take a step forward and talk about abelian groups, which is a specialized type of group. These groups hold one additional property in that they are commutative under the binary operation star. Now let's go ahead and talk about subgroups. A set H is a subgroup of group G if the following properties hold. Now just go ahead and take a moment to pause. We are using H to denote subgroups and G to denote the group. That's some notation that we'll be using throughout the rest of this. So H is a subgroup of group G if H is a subset of G, meaning that the elements of H are all elements of G, and H has to be a group. So we'll have to be holding those properties that we discussed earlier. To write that H is a subgroup of G, we go ahead and we use the less than sign. We also have the definition of H being a proper subgroup of G. H is a proper subgroup of G if H is a subgroup of G, and G is not equal to H, which is not equal to just the identity element. So these sets have to consist of more than just the identity element. And H is not a proper subgroup if H is the entire set. Sometimes you might see this written as H is less than or equal to G. Let's go ahead and look at subgroups with an example. Let's go ahead and work with the group Z mod 12 under addition. Now recall that those are the integers 0 through 11 with addition mod 12, meaning that once we reach 11, we go back to 0. So what I want you to do is go ahead and take a moment to pause this video and try to list out the subgroups of Z12 under addition. One tip that I have for you in doing that is to go ahead and look at the list that we have on the side of what groups must have particularly the fact that they must have an identity. So go ahead and work out what the identity element for Z12 under addition is and make sure that that's in all of your subgroups. And then the other important thing is to make sure that all of your elements have inverses and are closed. The associativity will follow from Z12 being a group. So go ahead and take a moment, pause this video and try to work those out now. All right, let's go ahead and move forward with this example. On the screen now, I've gone ahead and listed all of the subgroups of Z12 under addition. Go ahead and check those with what you got. You might be asking yourself at this point, how was I able to generate all of these and are there any tricks to generate these faster? Let's go ahead and talk about that. One of the tips for generating subgroups is to go ahead and pick one element in G and add that element to itself multiple times to see what elements we get. We do that to generate a subgroup because what we're doing is recognizing then that that group must be closed if we're only adding an element to itself and then putting all of those into the subgroup. So for example, the first one listed on my screen, the trivial subgroup of just zero being the identity element, I started with the element zero and added zero to itself several times. I only generated zero so that's the only element in that subgroup. The second subgroup is also considered trivial because it is the entire group, Z12. That is generated by taking the element 1 and adding it to itself consecutively in order to generate all of the elements of the set. Now that third one on the list, can you guess what that was generated by? That one was generated by the element 2. Or I started with 2. And I added 2 to itself to get 4, added another 2 for 6, another 2 for 8, and then up to 10. 10 got me back to 0, which was the identity. If you go ahead and look, all of our subgroups are actually generated by one of the elements 
in the group, and this will make it easier for finding subgroups in the future. This notation that you see on the side shows us how we denote these subgroups. What we use are we use the brackets and then the element that generated the subgroup. So for example, that fourth one down, you can see that it was generated by element three to give us zero, three, six, and nine. One other piece of notation that I wanna go ahead and look at is this idea of the order of an element in a group. And now the order of an element in a group is the number of elements in the subgroup generated by that element. So the order of element zero would be one because it only generates one element. Whereas the order of the element three is four because it generates four elements into its subgroup. So since we have groups and subgroups, we want to come up with some sort of organizational structure to keep track of all of those. And that's where subgroup lattices come in. Subgroup lattices are a structure for organizing a group and its subgroups. So now go ahead and give yourself some, some room on your paper if you're taking notes, so this is going to take a little bit of space. At the top of the section that you're working with, we're going to put Z12, the entire group that we're working with. Then what I want you to do is identify the largest subgroup of Z12. In this case, the largest subgroup is the subgroup containing 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. And we're going to go ahead and put that under Z12. We put it under Z12 because it is a subgroup of Z12. And to demonstrate that, we draw a line between that subgroup and Z12. Now let's go ahead and pick the second largest subgroup. We're going to put that on our paper as well. Since this subgroup, 0, 3, 6, and 9, is a different size, meaning it has dif a different number of elements, than the first subgroup we have written already on our page, we're going to put it a little lower than the subgroup that we already have. Now, this is a subgroup of Z12, so we draw a line to connect that as well. Now let's go ahead and identify the next largest subgroup, and that's the subgroup containing 0, 4, and 8. Now here's where things get a little interesting. Instead of drawing a line from that latest subgroup all the way up to Z12, we draw a line from that subgroup to the next lar smallest subgroup containing that subgroup, which in this case, that's the subgroup of 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. So we draw the line there. Again, let's continue the process with our next subgroup of 0, 6. Now you notice something interesting happened here as well. Because 0, 6 is a subgroup of two of the subgroups we have, we'll draw two lines heading to 0, 6. Now our last subgroup and the subgroup that will be the last subgroup in any one of these lattices is our identity element, which in this case is 0. And we put that at the bottom and we'll connect that to the three lowest subgroups that are in this example. We do that because 0 is a subgroup of those three, and those are the three that are lowest down in our lattice. Now, this is really messy because we have a lot of numbers going on, and as our groups get bigger, we'll have more elements to list here. So typically, subgroup lattices, instead of listing all of the elements, just go ahead and list the element that it was generated by. You can see in this structure, it's a lot simpler to understand where the groups and subgroups come from because we don't have all of the numbers written out there. So in review, today we discussed what groups are, which is a set and a binary operation where the operation is closed and associative, and there is an identity element for all elements, and there is an inverse for each element. We also discussed abelian groups, which are groups whose binary operation is commutative. Third, we looked at subgroups, which subgroups are a subset of the original set that's also a group. And finally, we looked at subgroup lattices, which is an organization structure for our subgroups. Thank you.